Hey guys. <laughs> hey guys. Live from UW. Brainworks. 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 The show where we learn about the brain. With me, Nog in the Brain. Did you know that brains and computers can talk to each other? In this episode of Brainworks, we're going to learn about brain computer interfaces, or BCIs. Welcome to Brainworks. My name's Eric Chudler. I'm a neuroscientist in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington. I'm also the executive director of the Center for Neurotechnology. What all that means is I'm really interested in learning about the brain. Hey, Jenna. Hey, Ben. Hey, Eric. Uh, what are you doing? I'm trying to catch this cockroach. Got it. Ew. Hey guys, need some help? Hey Elijah. Hey Jaden. What kind of an experiment could you do with a cockroach? Well, this cockroach will help me demonstrate some things about how the nervous system works. In fact, I'm trying to find out the next great idea about brain computer interfaces. Hey, maybe you guys can help. Yeah, we'd love to help. What is BCI? Is that where you control things with your mind? Or, you know, we could not do an experiment with the giant bug? Well, you see, every time you want to move your arm, your brain has to send an electrical signal down to your spinal cord, and then another electrical signal is sent down to the muscle of your arm, and that's how your arm moves. And also, every time something touches your skin, it works in the reverse way, in that electrical signals are sent from the skin to the spinal cord and up to the brain to tell you that something has touched your skin. So both your brain and machines, really, use electrical signals. So maybe you guys can help me with a new experiment. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. So why don't you grab some lab coats and some goggles and we'll get started. Okay. Okay, first what we need to do is get a cockroach leg. So I've got a cockroach over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take one of its back legs, snip it off, place it on this little board here. I'm going to vomit. Well, don't worry. The cockroach is asleep, and the leg will grow back. He'll be fine. So now what we're going to do is we take these pins, and we just pin it into the leg. One goes here, and one goes over here. And now what we can do is we turn on the little box here. And you hear that popcorn sound? Yeah. That's the actual electrical activity that's traveling in the cockroach leg nerve. And over here on this monitor here, we can see what those action potentials really look like. Who wants to give it a try to see how that cockroach leg will respond to someone touching it? I'll try. Okay, come on over here, Jaden. So here's a little probe here. And as she touches the cockroach leg, listen to see if that activity changes the sound. How is the leg still sending signals? Like, the cockroach is dead, right? Yeah, well, the cockroach isn't dead. The cockroach is recovering. But the nerves inside the leg still work, and they'll work for a long time. Nerves inside that leg, they're just waiting to be stimulated. So if I tap on it, those are electrical signals that are traveling up the leg. And if it had a brain, it would know that its leg was being touched. So does that mean our minds are electricity? Well, yeah. Uh, in fact, whenever we think of something, our brains make electrical signals. We're going to try to use an electrical signal to move the leg. We're going to send a song from my phone. So from the phone, we're going to go to a speaker. And then from this speaker, we're going to go to the leg. I'll show you how this works. So, Ben, go ahead and connect these two pins 
to two of the metal pins here. So now we have to find a song. All right. All right, so we got some music there, right? So you can hear the music. And now we're gonna turn this one on. And you see the leg move? <laughs> what we were doing there is using this device, which sends electricity out to a part of the body, in this case, a cockroach leg, right? And so we're using electrical signals to make a body part move, okay? And so just like your brain sent a signal down to your arm to move, we were using an artificial electrical signal to make a body part move. And that's part of a brain-computer interface, or BCI. Does that mean you can send electrical signals to something other than something that's inside your body? Ah, that's a great question. And in fact, I've got another experiment we can do to show how you can use your brain to control a machine. So let's get that set up. How much does a human spinal cord weigh? 10 grams, 35 grams, or 46 grams? Stay tuned to find out the answer. Additional program support provided by the Dana Foundation, your gateway to responsible information about the brain. More at Dana.org. How much does a human spinal cord weigh? 10 grams, 35 grams, or 46 grams? The answer is 35 grams. Before the break, we saw how an electrical signal can go from an artificial device to a nerve. Now let's check out what else the human brain is capable of. So in this experiment, what we're demonstrating is how Ben's brain can send an electrical signal down to his spinal cord and another electrical signal can be sent to a muscle in his arm. And that electrical signal that the muscle makes is sent to this device, which is then sent to this gripper. All right, Ben, go ahead and make a muscle. Good. And let go. And make a muscle. And let go. Jaden, why don't you try giving him the ball? See if you can pick it up. Okay, grab it. And let go. Okay, again. And let go. So do you think you have pretty good control? Yeah. Yeah. And how about uh, make, make, uh, make your fingers move individually? So why do you think that's not working? Why isn't that making the gripper move either? Look, when I move his arm like that, why doesn't that cause the gripper to move? Because it's not his forearm, it's just his elbow. That's right, and because his muscles aren't being contracted. So go ahead and you make a muscle and see what happens. When he makes a muscle, that causes electrical signals in the muscles to be sent to this little computer here that are then sent to this gripper. So this shows you can use electrical signals that the body generates itself to make a device like this artificial hand to move. Does it work on any part of the body? How about the face? Yeah, we can give that a try. Uh, who wants to give it a try? And go ahead and make a funny face and try to get that to move. <laughs> and then relax. And make a face. And there you go. Any muscle that generates electrical activity can make things happen in the outside world. Yo, I want to try it again, if that's OK. Yeah, sure, hold on. And Jenna, you can just take those off. It's just like a little Band-Aid. And we'll connect Ben back. And there you go. You're all connected. And see, he's controlling the lights, too. Do you think it could be wireless somehow? Do you think I could control somebody else's body with my body? If you can move it from a body to a machine, can't you move it from a machine to a body? Yeah, those are all great questions, and it's going to take a bit more sophisticated equipment than what we have right here. But I've got a brain surgeon friend and a neuroethicist who can answer some of those questions. So let's go talk to him. Come on. Okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, guys, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still strapped to the device. Um, guys? Eric? Anyone? How many nerve endings are in a hand? 1,300 per square inch, 75 per square inch, or 400 per square inch? Stay tuned to find out the answer.
with additional program support provided by the Dana Foundation, your gateway to responsible information about the brain. More at Dana.org. How many nerve endings are in a hand? 1,300 per square inch, 75 per square inch, or 400 per square inch? The answer is 1,300 per square inch. That's a lot of nerve endings for one little hand. Hi, Dr. Ojeman. Hi, how you doing? I'm good, how about you? Good, come on in. Eric sent us to come talk to you. What do all these posters mean? Is that a human skull? What are those wires for? You guys have a lot of questions. Why don't you come sit down? Yeah, gee, thanks, guys. So what is this place? Well, this is the grid lab, and one of the things we do is look at the signals that come from the uh, human brain in patients who have wires that are put in to study where their uh, seizures come from. Eric said that you put electrodes right on people's brains and zap them. That sounds dangerous. We do have patients who have wires that are put on their brain as part of a surgery. So how do people tell you what they feel if they're knocked out during brain surgery? They're knocked out for when we put the wires in, which are thin wires like this that go on the surface of the brain. And then we can both record from these pads, but also put a little bit of current in there after the surgery. So they're awake and the brain doesn't have any pain fibers on it. So usually they just feel a buzz or a tingle. What's that hand for? So one of the things that we want to know is how does the brain take in information. We can study how uh, sensory areas work by looking at what's called a rubber hand illusion, because the hand is rubber. And the illusion is that if I touch this hand while I'm touching your hand and your hand is hidden, you'll start to think that this is your actual hand. And you, you'll have a hard time convincing yourself that your real hand is back under the covers. Uh, and it's because the brain puts together where it sees you're being touched with where it feels you're being touched. And so one of the things we want to learn is how does the brain put all that information together. And that could be really useful if you had an artificial hand, because we want that to feel as natural as possible. Interesting. What else is brain mapping able to do to help people? It's been used for trying to recreate uh, vision. So if you uh, put a small amount of current on the vision parts of the brain, which are in the back part, you can make little bright lights. And if you make the current small enough, you could make part of a scene uh, visible to somebody who's blind. But there's a ton of the brain that we don't understand what happens when you stimulate. Because a lot of times you'll put current there and nothing happens. But then if you ask somebody to do something, like talk, then it might be able to stop it. And so it's much harder to map because we don't even know what questions to ask. So if we're going to come up with the next big thing for BCI, we have to see it in action, right? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. What you should do is go next door to where my engineering colleagues are, and they can show you what we're doing. Great. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Good. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. We heard that some researchers were using a BCI to play some sort of game here in the computer science and engineering building. So we figured if you could use a BCI to play a game, you could use it for so much other stuff. So we're down here at the lab of Dr. Rajesh Rao to visit one of his students, Jenny Cronin. Let's check it out. Jenny? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Ojiman sent us. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm Jaden. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Hi, I'm Jenny. Elijah. Nice to meet you, Elijah. Ah, so what do you want to ask me about? So Dr. Ogerman showed us how you can put electrodes right on the brain and read it. How is that different from what you do here? Yeah, so what Dr. Ogerman was showing you is called ECOG, or electrocorticography, and the electrodes sit right on top of the surface of the brain. But here we work with EEG, or electroencephalography, and those electrodes sit on top of the, your skull. So right on top of your skin here, and you don't need surgery for it, which means that anybody, including one of you two, can try it. Um, so does one of you want to give it a try? Yeah, I do. Okay. So you're going to pull it on over your ears. It's a little bit like headphones. There you go. How's that? Is that comfortable? Mm hmm Okay. Next, we're going to tighten these electrodes a little bit. So these are called dry electrodes. So actually, Elijah, you can do this. <laughs> if you put it in right here. You can kind of twist these just to move Jaden's hair out of the way because we want to get some contact with her skin. It'll make it easier to record the signal. Awesome. Can you feel that on your skin? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, Jane, why don't you sit down here, and we'll try this experiment. Okay, we got to clip these to your ears. 
And the experiment we're going to run is called a uh, SSVEP experiment, or Steady State Visually Evoked Potential. So these two cups here have LED lights in them. So they're going to flash at a certain frequency, which is like a rhythm that they flash at. And the, um, our occipital lobe, which is in the back of our head, is the part of our brain that processes all the visual information that comes in. So can you, like, read Jane's mind with that? No, we can't exactly read someone's mind. Our technology is not at that point at all. But what we can do is get an idea of what we think is happening in the brain. Elijah, do you want to come over here? You can see it. Take a minute to run. Let's see what's... What you're going to see up here is a cursor, and it's going to move to the left if you look at this um, light, or it'll move to the right if you look at this light on the right. Since it's wireless, that means it's Bluetooth. Can it get interrupted? Yeah, that's a great question. So Bluetooth could get interrupted. Um, you could have a problem with just the computer connecting to Bluetooth, just like any Bluetooth device can have that issue. Uh, there's also some concern that whether it's maliciously or just unintentionally, a Bluetooth signal from a neural device could be interrupted, and it's causing a problem to the user, which would be a bad thing. So there's people in the neuroethics community here at the University of Washington and elsewhere that are looking into that and doing research on um, how we protect people who are using a uh, brain-computer interface. Okay, so this is going to connect to the EEG headset. And then you're going to see a cursor come up here in a moment. You, for yes, you can look to the left or the left um, LED here. And the cursor should move to the left. So if you look here. And then next will be no. So you want to look towards um, the no LED, which is this one on the right. And the cursor should move to the right. And Elijah, you can see those purple bars are moving up and down depending on um, what the program and the analysis uh, thinks that uh, what light Jaden is looking at. So we'll look to the left again on the next one. And then here on the left side of the screen, that's the actual brain recording. So those are the brain signals. You can see some noise in them, and that's natural. It's just because we're recording from through the skull, through the skin, through our hair. So you get noise in the signal. It's this top one there that says OZ. That's where the occipital lobe in the back of your head where all your visual information is processed. That's the one we're actually using or this program is using to determine if Jaden's looking um, at the LED that's flashing at the no frequency. Um, or the LED that's flashing at this frequency that we set to yes. So what kind of information are you getting from this? You can imagine that someone, especially down the road if we get better at using EEG signals, someone could use this to answer questions or to move a cursor on a screen towards one, like one flashing light frequency or towards another one to answer yes, no questions. Um, if you're doing something like imagined motor movements, so there's other brain signals we can look at as well. There's some that occur if you're surprised about something or if a, something flashes on the screen that you're interested in. And we can use those to help people that um, have some kind of uh, neurodegenerative problem or have had an accident and have, are paralyzed. We can use that to help them communicate. All right, so that ends it. So that did, uh, I think that does eight trials. And then it's recorded all the data so we could look at it again if we wanted to. We could open it up in a different software program. Or we can leave it just like this and you've just interacted with that computer just you, by looking at these lights and then recording signals from, um, from your brain. Okay, let's take this off. That was awesome. I, I can't believe you were able to make that cursor move with your mind. I mean, it's so cool. Uh, that was really fun. Thanks for letting us try it out. I think we have another idea to bring back to the rest of the team. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. We know that brain-computer interfaces can help people who've been seriously injured. People who've lost an arm can actually get a robotic replacement. Electricity can help in other ways. We are here at the AMP Lab to talk to someone who uses electrical stimulation to treat their injuries. Thanks for having us, Dr. Moritz. So, what is the AMP Lab? Well, AMP stands for Amplify Movement and Performance. And one of the things we do here is to use electrical stimulation to help people with spinal cord injury learn how to use their hands again or even walk again after they've had an injury. So, just shocking people helps them? 
Well, it's more complicated than just shocking, but we do use electrical stimulation, which is the language of the nervous system, to help amplify the activity in the spinal cord below the injury, and that helps people practice using their hands or standing and walking. And it turns out after a lot of practice, they actually recover the ability to do that on their own, even when the stimulator is no longer used. So, you guys are still trying to figure all this out? We are. We don't know exactly how it works yet, but we're seeing some really compelling evidence that even after the stimulator turns off, people remain uh, better or even healed. And so that tells us that there's plasticity or learning happening in the brain and the spinal cord after injury. So what does this feel like for the patient? That's a really good question. We actually have a participant here today if you'd like to ask her. Sure, let's do it. Five years ago, I was injured in a car accident. I had to drive a wheelchair with my chin because my hands wouldn't work. Slowly, over time, some of my function came back because I have what's called an incomplete injury, which means the spinal cord was not severed. So some function can come back over, over about a year to maybe 15 months. So I spent that next year trying to get better and better, and I did a little bit, but I still have a lot of, um, I guess, dysfunction in my legs and in my hands, but I work every day to uh, continue growing the strength that I do have to make sure that I can be as functional as possible in my daily life. So what are you doing here at the Amplet? So this is a study that's going to focus on improving my upper body function. So I have something called central spinal cord syndrome, which means that my lower body works a little bit better than my upper body. So I really would love to improve the function in my hands. So I come in every day and we put stimulation on the back of my neck where the spinal cord is and I do activities like this or anything you would find in a preschool to work on my fine motor skills and just practice and practice and practice and see if the stimulation helps the nerves connect from my brain to my fingertips. What are you hoping to get out of the study? You know, I'm hoping to get more hand function. Even 10% more hand function for me makes the difference in zipping up a jacket or grabbing a glass of water, brushing my teeth, um, maybe even playing an instrument. And that would make a big difference in the independence in my life. Yeah, so to help Jessie get more hand function, we've placed these electrodes on the back of her neck, above and below where her spinal cord is injured. And we're using this stimulator, which Fatma is controlling, to deliver very high frequency stimulation through the skin to her spinal cord. While the stimulator is running, Jessie works really hard to move her hands and practice new and challenging activities. And it seems like the combination of the stimulation and that practice is what might make Jessie better in the long term. What's next for this new technology? Well, in addition to helping Jesse's hands get better, we're also really interested in testing the stimulator to see if we can help people stand, balance, and even to walk. So it's possible that Jesse could participate in one of our other studies where we use the stimulator to improve walking. Well, thank you so much for telling us your story, and it was really nice meeting you. Yeah. Hey, let's go get Eric and the others. Okay, great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you later. How many pairs of spinal nerves exist in the human body? 45, 65, or 31? Stay tuned to find out the answer. The additional program support provided by the Dana Foundation, your gateway to responsible information about the brain. More at Dana.org. How many pairs of spinal nerves exist in the human body? 45, 65, or 31? The answer is 31 pairs. Now that everyone has seen BCIs in action, it's time to find Eric and learn what all of this means for the future. Welcome back. I'd like to introduce you to Sarah Guerin. She works in the Department of Philosophy here at the University of Washington. I hear that you guys have been touring some BCI labs here at UW. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've seen so far? Elijah and I saw how brain signals can actually be recorded. Jenna and I actually met someone who was in an accident, and they use electrical signals to help repair their spinal cord. It's completely changed their life for the better. I do neuroethics in the philosophy department. And these are the kinds of things that we look at, trying to think about the design process for BCIs so that we can produce a device that's going to be really helpful and benefit people like the woman that you saw before, but that also pays attention to some of the 
what we might call side effects that can happen that could put people at risk in various ways. I think what's interesting is someone being able to hack into someone's brain or limb down the line when technology advances and becomes more developed. It could be a possibility and make people think, hmm, maybe I shouldn't get this new technology. So if somebody has access to what's going on in your brain, even though they can't really read it well and know details about your thoughts, you might want to have control over who knows. People that have more money have a lot more access or a louder voice to the new innovations that you and your group are working with. And so I'm wondering how you decide whether or not it's fair for people with more money or people with less money but still have the same problems get to um, have access to your program. Yeah, I think it's a really good question because in this case, even participating in research seems like it offers some sort of benefit, right? Because if the device is working, then you can control some things around you that you couldn't control before. And of course, right, the hope is that you can recruit people into studies that represent the whole diversity of, of the people in the nation rather than just the most privileged. But that, it can be challenging to do. Thanks for joining us here at Brainworks. We've learned a lot about how brains and computers can talk to each other. Yeah, both brains and computers send electrical signals to communicate. By connecting brains to computers, we can control things with our mind. This has really helped people struggling to recover from bad accidents. But we have to be careful when using this technology and that it exists for everyone. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time for Brainworks. I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of research I want to do and some ideas I want to try. Me too. Yeah. Let's go. See you later. See you.